What's up, Resonate? Good to see you guys. Um, have you ever had a moment that uh, in that moment, uh, you all of a sudden realize that there's something that is about to happen or there's something that happens that absolutely ruins that moment and creates another more significant moment? Um, I, I don't know if you've had a moment like that. Uh, just to help us to understand and get on the same page, uh, I thought I'd bring some pictures that you can just kind of extrapolate um, how moments change really quickly. So let, let's see the first one. So there you go. That's that one thing. That guy doesn't know what's happening. He's posing, right, that, and, and, and we don't see the next picture, but we know it's not good. Let's go to the next one. Okay, here's that, like, that moment where you're like, how does that happen? Who is that kid, right? Maybe you've been that kind of kid, right? That moment where you're like, I'm just going to head the ball. Instead, instead you, got it, you get it in the face, right? Uh, let's, let's go on. Or how about that moment where you're like, let's have fun on the ATV, right? And then grandma doesn't know what's going to happen, right? I love her look. Like, if you have a grandma, haven't you seen her give you that look at some point, you know? What happens in this next moment, right? They're just like, hey, let's take this around the farm. And then all of a sudden, little brother goes flying. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's a fist fight after this, right? Okay, so there's this next one, right? Who decided this was a good idea, right? You're just having a moment, and then all of a sudden, there's a moment that comes that's more significant, right? You just so wish you had the next picture, right, to find out how this played out. Hold on, hold on, go, let's go back. Let's hold, hold that back. How about that kid? Is he like, what is he doing in the background? Is that a popsicle? Is he having a popsicle? Okay, let's go to the next one. This one's kind of... <laughs> It takes a moment, right? One moment, you're just sitting there having a photo. <laughs> oh, I just crack up every time. Next one. As you begin to think about that, what you have to understand is... Uh, there's moments that we have, and we don't know what comes next, but being able to understand, hey, there might be something that happens in my life that radically changes that moment. And those moments that we have, as I begin to think about where we're at, and as we talk about um, the book of Luke, and as we move through this story of how the story of Jesus fulfills the story of the whole world, and underlying really what that means for us, this week as I studied this, I went back and I, and I thought about um, really what we don't know is going to happen and really the moments that we don't uh, realize are about to happen in our life and how significant some of those are. And to be able to think about when we look back and see those moments, just how profound that is. I thought about uh, the early church and I thought about when people begin to hear the story of Jesus for the very first time, and I thought about what would it have been like. So you have uh, 2,000 years ago, a group of people, and uh, there's, you know, it starts with the, just about 120 of these, of these people, but Luke is writing this, the story of, of Jesus, and then he writes the story of Acts, but he, but he writes them all together. And by the end of the book of Acts, as he's writing all this out, uh, what has happened is that 120 people has just mushroomed into this underground illegal movement that's happening that is kind of subversive to the Roman Empire. And yet, as we find out, um, the Roman Empire, as it is the likely the greatest uh, empire that has ever existed, this thing that starts off with just 120 people begins to es escalate underground until it ultimately transforms this Roman Empire, right? It, it transforms it in not just a subversive way, but a very public way as Constantine makes Christianity the, the official religion of the Roman Empire. And what happens along the way is fascinating because what we get to see is this, that there's gr these groups of people begin to hear about this movement called Christianity, this movement of following Jesus. And it's likely that they are in these house churches and, um, and, and it's likely at some point that they begin to know um, people that follow Jesus and they begin to understand what that means and they've likely uh, at some point begin to know someone who was persecuted or even was killed because they were a follower of Jesus. And in this, 
as they begin to have this moment where, let's say they begin to, by some incredible opportunity, they get to have this, this text that, that Luke communicates who Jesus is. And they've heard these people who've decided to follow Jesus, and this is underground, illegal movement that, that just cannot seem to be stopped because it's not about a product, it's about an idea. And this idea begins to transform people, and they begin to say, okay, I don't know what this is about, but I do know that people are being radically transformed. And they begin to slowly figure out who Jesus is. And this understanding of Jesus begins to change them as well. And, and this idea, and what we're going to get into, I think about how, as they heard these words, and as they heard about this miracle of Jesus, and as they heard about the story of Jesus, how maybe with fresh ears, they begin to further understand what it means to follow after Christ and what it means for this idea to radically transform their lives. And as they look at people whose lives have been transformed and say, I want to be like this, at some point they begin to understand the why behind all of that. And as they begin to have access to this text, it begins to help them have a radically different viewpoint of their life. And this is the story of Christianity. And this is the story of how this began to, to rapidly begin to mushroom and begin to create a movement. And it's around the idea and around the ideas that we've been talking about. Look, but, but as we begin to look at this idea today, I want you to understand that this idea as it has been embedded into people's lives has transformed them and has thus transformed cultures as well. And so Getting into this, as we hear about Jesus and his interaction with, 12, or with 10 lepers, I want you to get how this has transformed lives in the past and can transform your life today as you get to hear it. So we're going to get into this. And what we get to see is a miracle, a miracle of Jesus. We see five of these in, the, in Luke. This is the fourth one. It has the most significance in terms of size uh, with 10 people being healed. But these moments, um, as we look at these miracles, C.S. Lewis says it like this, miracles are retelling in small letters of a story written in letters too large for some of us to see. That what he does in these miracles is point to something greater. That what he does as he begins to work miracles is he begins to say, hey, there's something bigger. There's something more significant. And those ideas end up transforming societies. So we see at the end of his doing these physical miracles, there's about 120 people. But ultimately it points to the greatest miracle that's transformed millions of people. So as we get this, we're going to be in Luke chapter 17, verse 11. You can turn with me there in your copy of scripture. You can look up on the screen as we begin to get into this incredible story about Jesus' interaction with these 10 lepers. It says this, while traveling to Jerusalem, he passed between Samaria and Galilee. Now, just a second, before we go any further, uh, I want you to get that um, Luke originally wrote this on, uh, on a scroll. It was uh, difficult to, to obtain, um, you know, something to write on uh, that was a valuable thing. So every word that we begin to see in this, uh, there's a meaning behind this. Luke chose and said, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he chose things. And this is really important because what we see in this first few words of this story is it connects what we'll see to the very end of the story. The beginning and the end of the story point to a reality. So Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Let me help you to understand what that means is that Jesus is on his way to fulfill the reason that he came to earth. He's on the way to the cross. And the narrative that we get at this point in Luke is we begin him to see him clearly point his eyes to fulfilling why he came, and that is to engineer his death on a Roman cross for our benefit so that he may pay the cost for our accessing our heavenly father. And this is, uh, this is kind of the point of, of, of where we begin to see the rest of this story played out. So in light of that, he's not just physically on this way to Jerusalem. Like he is headed towards his ultimate destination, which is uh, the cross and ultimately his death. And it says that he passed between Samaria and Galilee. Verse 12, it says this. As he entered a village, 10 men with sk serious skin diseases met him. They stood at a distance and raised their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Now this is really key for us to understand what's going on there because when we begin to see in the text that there's these serious skin diseases, 
And, uh, and really what we begin to see is they are at a distance. What we begin to understand is that they had a thing called leprosy, or we call it Hansen's disease in modern terms. Hansen's disease or leprosy in that day and age was a non-curable disease that began to ultimately on the extremities uh, and, and in edges kind of of our tissue, it began to erode the, the sensation and the nerve endings, which ultimately led people to do what happens when you cannot experience any pain. They began to operate without the sensation of pain, which would cause them to take caution. And so therefore, around their body, um, especially on the ends of their extremities, they would begin to have these sores. And these sores, because of the lack of blood flow, would not be able to heal quickly. And so they would be um, someone who had these sores. They would be uh, missing fingers, toes, nose. It began to affect um, their speech through their larynx. And they would be, be um, ultimately kind of in this state where their body is rotting away even though it's not dead yet, but they knew there was no ultimate, there was no ultimate cure for this. And so they were effectively a dead people walking. They, were, they knew that this was going to end in their premature death. And it was also highly communicable. And so what would be normal would be this, that they would take these lepers and they would isolate them outside of town. So there would be these leper colonies, right? All these people who were uh, infe infected with leprosy, they would be basically cast outside of town. And when they would be walking, here's what they would have to do. In order to protect everyone else by law, they had to shout the words, unclean, unclean. And so that people would be able to get out of their way because they didn't want to be around them. So their lives, they were isolated. Their bodies were decaying in front of them. Um, they would have to shout out in a loud voice, obviously, as they begin to walk towards people, something that would identify with the most significant issue of their life. Can you imagine having to state the words, I'm unclean, get away from me. This is like the worst nightmare that we would have. That It not only is a place that isolates us, we wouldn't be around our family, around our friends, we wouldn't be able to engage in anything normal people would be able to engage in. And it would be also something that we ourselves would have to pronounce as we went through life. This is the scenario that we find in. And as Jesus enters into this town, there are 10 of these guys that are at a distance and likely with a hoarse voice um, at the top of their lungs so that Jesus could hear, they say to him this. Um, they, they say to him, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. It's obvious what is afflicting them. And here's what they, they, they see Jesus and they say, maybe he can do something about this. Maybe Jesus can do something about our issue. In verse 14, this is, a, this is just a powerful phrase. He says, when he saw them, here's what he did. He told them, go and show yourselves to the priest. And while they were going, they were healed. Now, I love the way that this happens with Jesus. So what Jesus does is he tells them the conclusion before the process has even started. And, and what you need to understand, just so, just so you can understand what Jesus is doing, is that these priests would be the people uh, that would be able to identify whether someone was clean or unclean. And so as people would live out their lives, um, as they begin to have a, a desire for a relationship with the Holy God, one of the things that the Old Testament makes clear is, a, uh, is unclean people can't be able to associate with a holy God. And so they would put in all of these regulations and they would put all these things in to make sure that someone held the responsibility of identifying who was clean and who was unclean. And that was the role of the priest. And so in order for them to be made clean again, they would have to go to a priest, which would be able to proclaim them clean, which would enable them to re-enter into this world, into their society, into everything else that would happen. So what does Jesus say? Go and show yourself to the priest. Effectively, I'm already going to tell you what to do. And they begin to make the journey to the priest. And it says, on the way, they were healed. And this is such an amazing moment as we see the compassion of Jesus to be able to identify and to do something about the issues of these random 10 guys on the side of the road in a random town as he's heading towards Jerusalem. And that day, as, you be, as you're thinking about that, what an incredible moment 
of unexpected realities, that you wake up as a leper and you return home as someone who is made clean. It would have been like this. Someone, if, if a member of your family would be on death row, right? They're, they're separated away from you. You can't really have uh, physical touch, but you also know that they are going to be ultimately, uh, that's, a, that's a statement of death, that, that ultimately they are going to be killed because of this issue. And what if someone that you knew was on death row would just one night show up in your house? What a mind-blowing experience this would be. What a, what a radically different experience that you were going about your day and then all of a sudden something happens and totally changes it. Something totally radically changes the life that you thought you were living. And here's where we begin to see these, these things continue to work themselves out. Because it's not the end of the story as they were leaving and were healed. If we were to think this is just what Jesus did and Jesus was full of random miracles and Jesus just had compassion and Jesus just decided to say, hey, you have an issue. I'm going to have the ability to do something about your issue, so I'm just going to do something. That's missing a significant part of the story. And oftentimes when we see this story played out, um, the significance of what happens next is, is really lost because Jesus never takes and wastes a moment. He always takes these moments and points them back to something significant. And here we see this next little piece in verse 15. In verse 15, it says this, but one of them, seeing that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice gave glory to God. He fell face down at his feet, thanking him. And he was the Samaritan. Now in this two, two verse kind of phrase here, kind of this, this unpacking of this thing, we begin to see something significant. That one out of the 10 has a significantly different behavior that he displays. And it points to something that's going on deeper. It says, seeing that he was healed, what he did is he returned. It says, with a loud voice, right? This is speaking for people who understood this, this idea of leprosy. This would have been twofold. One, that he was healed. And two, that he was unashamed. That he was in a loud voice. It says this, he gave glory to God or he worshiped God. He fell face down at his feet, thanking him. He's displaying such a significant moment of gratitude, being able to say, I thought I was on death row. I thought my life was over, isolated, uh, rotting body, but you gave me life. And he goes back. And then at the end, as Luke begins to tell about why this is significant, he puts at the very end a modifying phrase in telling the kind of guy this was. And there's a guy named, as a guy who was a Samaritan. And the Samaritan, uh, as, as you begin to kind of get into this understanding, what you begin to find is that Jews and Samaritans were two different groups of people that absolutely hated each other. And Jews saw the Samaritans as like uh, people that had been Jews at some point and inter, interbred with other, other races, other ethnicities, other, other religions. And they were like the half-breeds. These were the people who were isolated and, uh, and they would walk around Samaria. So there was, Drew, there was Judea and there was Samaria. In order for them to, if they needed to get to some place, they would decide to walk around it. It was that much of a detested and hated group of people. But we see here, Luke clearly saying that the one guy that we would not expect, as he's telling this to a group of people with a Jewish back, the one guy that we would never expect to display the kind of behavior that ultimately Jesus recognizes and commends is a guy who was a Samaritan, the most hated, the, the person that they could never wrap their mind. Like, this is the guy that gets it right. This is the guy. And so it just, as he begins to sh share this, it begins to put such a dichotomy from the nine and the one Samaritan, the nine Jewish guys and the one Samaritan guy. And what happens is it begins to share with him that this guy, it was not just an outcast because of his leprosy, it was an outcast in this context because of his, because of his ethnicity and being a Samaritan. And here's where we begin to see Jesus begin to respond to this man who is worshiping at his feet. Here's what he says. Jesus said, we're not 10 cleansed. Where are the nine? 
Didn't any return to give glory to God except this foreigner? He says, this is the only time this occurs in the, in the New Testament. This, this word foreigner, Jesus is clarifying how significant this is. In verse 19, and he told him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, this is a, a kind of a fascinating interaction. This man, uh, as a part of these nine or ten guys, asks Jesus for healing. Jesus heals him. He's the one that comes back. He falls at his feet. He's giving glory to God. He thanks him. And then Jesus says something that, that on the surface doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? He says, get up on go away. Your faith has made you well. And, and as we look at this, and, and if we don't really dig into this whole context from the beginning, as Jesus is heading to the cross to this moment where he's talking about your faith has made you well, we can miss a very significant part of this story. Because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, because it says earlier in verse 15 that seeing he was healed that this man already had the context of being healed. This man already knew the, that, that his body had no longer had leprosy riddled throughout it. That that, had, that is a clear moment. And then Jesus says, your faith has made you well. And as we look at that, we have to ask, what is Jesus actually meaning by this? And this is where we get into how incredible this story is. And here's the idea that has changed people after people. This is, the, this is the idea that begins to open our eyes to the fact that the moment is much, much bigger than we think it is. This is the moment that begins to implant the idea that transforms societies, that transforms people, because here's what we begin to see, is that Jesus is hinting that this physical healing is pointing to so, something that is so much, so much better. And as we begin to realize this is not just about gratefulness, this is about the gospel itself, about what Jesus is on his way to do. The word uh, well there, to, that your faith has made you well, that, those, that phrase there has a single Greek word behind it, and that's the Greek word sozo. And that word sozo means to save or to, or to keep from death. It's the same word that we see in other places talking about this decision, this, this context of us saying, this is what it looks like for, uh, for us to be saved by Christ, for ultimately us to be transformed by Christ, ultimately in a salvation kind of aspect. And in this, what Luke begins to do, this is this moment where Luke elevates Jesus and he begins to, to give a picture of what Jesus is trying to help us see, is that when he says this, that your faith has saved you, it, we begin to realize that Jesus is not just talking about the faith to ask their quest, that there's something else, that he, is, he returns to Jesus. This faith is pointing to a bigger, a bigger story in this way. That Luke here presents Jesus as, we see this, this guy is coming to, coming to Christ, right? And what does Jesus say? He says, didn't any return to give glory to God? Jesus is referring to himself as God. He's understanding his role as, as God in this. And as we look to see this, what, what Luke is doing is he's showing Jesus, communicating that in fact, Jesus is the temple. That, that Jesus is taking on the framework of the temple. The temple was where God dwelled, right? Where heaven and earth kind of met. God was in this place and you would go to this place and you would worship God. What is he doing? He's coming to this place. He is worshiping God. He's not only saying this, he's saying go to the priest, right? But we begin to see Jesus is articulating himself as the high priest, the intermediator between humanity and God. And this is the role of Jesus in the world that he might be able to be the person who's the conduit between us and God, the person who has come that we might be able to know God through Jesus Christ. What he's saying, this is so profound, is when he says go to the priest, go to the temple, and have the priest and show yourself to the priest, he's talking about himself. He's talking about what he's doing. He's understanding this is something that he is playing out, not just in a physical sense, but in an eternal sense. What he's doing for the body, he is also doing for the soul. And this is incredible as you begin to see that it is a significantly bigger idea that he presents the, this, this Christology or the study of Jesus Christ, that we begin to see what he is ultimately saying about himself. 
that if we were to interview the nine lepers collectively, they would say that the most amazing thing about this encounter was that they were healed from leprosy. The Samaritan, however, would say that the most amazing thing about this encounter was that he met Jesus, the one who could heal leprosy. The Samaritan met the Messiah, the Son of God, and he's the one that got the most significant healer, the better healing, the one that didn't just heal the body, but healed the soul. He's talking about your faith has saved you. You came to this context of not just what I did, but who I am. And this is really key for us because we can never, ever understand Jesus as just something that we can get something from, something to be used, something to be ultimately um, orchestrated for our benefit. Ultimately, Jesus is not a product. Jesus is a person. That God does this so that you might understand the relationship with him, not just so that he might be able to give stuff to us. This is, this is key. Let's go, let's go back to that death row illustration. Let's say you're on death row, that you're in the cell. Someone comes to the cell, has the key, opens the door and says, I'm the president and you're pardoned. And it's this person that holds the power to do something about your issue. And maybe he says, go and tell the judge that I've pardoned you. But clearly in your mind, you have to understand that it is just the judge who might be the person that gives the, you know, the, the clarity to this, but it is, it is this person that stands in front of you that has the power to do so. And Jesus recognized this. And Jesus, rec- or not Jesus, this, this one man recognized, this Samaritan recognized this. And what we begin to see is the power that we have embedded into this. That this is the gospel. That Jesus did for you what you cannot do for yourself. That as we are separated on, uh, on, on our desires to be our own God, God from our heavenly father, that Jesus Christ came and paid on our behalf the penalty of our sin, which was the gift of his life on a cross. And then ultimately through his resurrection proved his power over sin and death. This is the good news, and this is what is the ultimate news. And this thing that Jesus did on the cross ultimately to transform your life is the ultimate news for your life. And as you begin to understand what this means, it is essential. Again, this is the idea that transforms, is that when we understand what is ultimate, it begins to clarify what is urgent in our life. Let me say it this way. When your greatest need is met, what happens to your urgent need? It it begins to be optional. See, when your ultimate need is met, your urgent becomes optional. Your urgent becomes optional. This This is huge. I need you to get this because what we begin to see here is Jesus taking this moment and Luke being able to say, hey, there's something bigger here. There's a bigger storyline that this is not just about thankfulness for these guys that are getting healed. It's about something that's bigger. And that is that Jesus didn't just come to meet their most urgent need. He came to meet their ultimate need, but only one figured out what their ultimate need was. Only one realized that it wasn't just about the product of healing. It was the person of Jesus. And in this What happens is that when we begin to understand that Jesus meets our ultimate need, it absolutely changes everything else in our lives. It changes everything. Everything that seems urgent simply becomes optional when your greatest need is met, when your ultimate need is met. Let that land in your heart because that will radically transform your life your lens through anything else that you see in your world, when you begin to see that Jesus has done something for you that has met your ultimate need, it transforms the way you see your most urgent needs. And you think, oh man, I've got to get God to do this. And my prayers are packed. Hey, I need this to happen. And I want this thing to happen. I want this thing. And we can, what, what can happen is we can work ourselves up into a frenzy. We can work ourselves up into a context of anxiety and worry. And this can dominate our life. And we can absolutely forget, just like the nine guys, of what this was ultimately about. To go to the person who had the power of Jesus Christ. This is key. And I want to give you one other context for this. 
Because here we see where Jesus met their urgent needs and ultimate needs. But what, are, what happens in those moments? When Jesus doesn't meet our urgent needs, what do we do with that? Because that can be a crisis of faith. Maybe you've prayed and say, God, I need you to do this. I need you to come through with me on this. And, and nothing happened. Does that lead you to a crisis of faith thinking, is God really good? Does he really love me? Does he have it out for me? There's a guy in the Bible named John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is a guy who is the cousin of Jesus. And we have a moment in, in the text where we get to see John saying to Jesus, um, basically, are you going to get me out of this jam? Because what John had done is he had taken, he angered the ruler. And what he said was ultimately that this, he called out, he called a spade a spade and said, hey, this ruler is not acting like a ruler should act. This ruler is engaging in things that, uh, uh, that ultimately shouldn't be the case. And he calls out this specific sin that, that this ruler is. As he calls this out, what happens is the ruler takes offense and puts him into the dungeon, ultimately to be beheaded. Through, a, through an entire thing, what we begin to see is John, who is fearful of his life. And John, who says to Jesus, hey, Jesus, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect somebody else? Hey, the code word is this. Hey, I'm in a bind. Hey, are you actually the one who's gonna do something about all of this? Because I need you right now. And Jesus sends back words, word, word to John, his cousin, right? If there's anyone that you would say, hey, you're gonna do a miracle, you're gonna do something, but he sends out something to John and he says, he says this, Yes, the lame see, the blind, uh, sorry, the lame walk, the blind see. And then he says, blessed are those who do not fall away on my account. And this is code word for this. I'm not coming for you, John, but I am the one who's ultimately met your ultimate need. I'm the one who's met your ultimate need, but I'm not going to meet your urgent need. This is Jesus and as we begin to understand what he is doing, and as what we begin to see how this begins to play, play itself out, what it does is when we begin to understand the ultimate need that Jesus meets of ours, it begins to give us context for the urgent. And so let me help you to understand, hey, when the urgent becomes optional, it transforms your life. It does this. One is, is joy gets recalibrated. Why is this important to you? Why does, why does the, the ultimate thing that Jesus does ultimately affect your life, right? One, because your joy gets recalibrated. Now, what does that mean? It means this, that oftentimes as, as I'm around this world, people are trying to figure out mental ways to be happy, right? Hey, just have a positive outlook on life and just try to manipulate your thought process um, so that you might feel good about things and just believe the best. And, uh, and it's, ultimately a lot of mental gymnastics to try to believe good things about the world so that you might have a positive outlook. And I think that you should. But the key is when Jesus has done something about your greatest need, when he has done something that ultimately affects your life, then it begins to help you to see a lens through the rest of your life. That when you begin to see that Jesus has done something this significant, you can begin to have joy in the face of circumstances that don't seem very joyous. Because you can look back and say, you know what? Because of what Jesus has done, even though this moment is hard, even though the situation is difficult, I still have joy. And what you begin to see is these people that call themselves Christians in the first century, they were radical people because it seemed like you would try to kill them and they would still have joy. It seems like they would go through persecution and it was like you couldn't beat the joy out of them. Why? Because Jesus has already done the work. Jesus already did something so you can kill the body, but ultimately Jesus won the war. And in this, it began to transform their lives. I want you to get joy is calibrated always in a comparison, meaning this. That when you see the way that joy uh, works, what you have joy in ultimately is connected to the way that you see the world and the calibration that you have, right? Have you ever been to a place and, you, and, and maybe they don't have, I, I think going to third world countries and sometimes I see people and I'm like, how can they be so, so joyful, right? They have all this difficulty around them, but their calibration of joy is different than yours and mine oftentimes. That when we begin to think about our lives and you look at somebody and say, how can you have joy? It's because their joy is calibrated on a different scale. That there's something it's rooted in. 
I was in Indonesia not too long ago. And I was there and there was this, uh, this guy who was a believer in the place that we were staying. And, uh, and the guy didn't have a whole lot, was very poor, um, lived this life radically different from ours. But in this, I, he was so joyful. Why? Because his joy was calibrated to something else. I mean, just think about it. If, if in your life, if you're scared for your life and get a wound, then you're like, I don't care about the fact that I lost my foot. I'm alive and I thought I was going to be dead. It would be helpful to have a foot, but it would also be better to be alive, right? And so you have a calibrated sense of joy. So you might not have a foot, but you're alive. Now, what if you get a bruise, right? And you're like, oh, this really stinks. And all of a sudden I'm really depressed because my foot's injured. But at least you have a foot, right? Calibration of joy. Dumb illustration. I just thought it. It's not in my notes. Um, (laughs) This is something for us to be able to say, what does it look like? And is your joy calibrated on the right thing? It recalibrates our joy. Number two, what we begin to see is that when we begin to see the, the ultimate in Jesus, it begins to replace um, fear with thanksgiving. That thanksgiving begins to replace fear so that you don't operate in worry and anxiety because ultimately something has been done. Something has already been accomplished. Man, my desire is, is to see the work of Jesus and the resurrection change your depression and change your anxiety and change your worry and all those moments where you're spinning the, the things in your, uh, in your mind over the consequences or, or the, the context in your life and you're trying to figure out how is this going to work itself out? Is this going to work itself out? That that would begin to be replaced by the deep peace of God and that you might be able to say, I, I'm at peace Because all of that stuff doesn't matter in light of Jesus accomplishing an ultimate reality. I want to see us be a different kind of people. See, the one thing that could never be denied in the very beginning of this story called Christianity is that these people were different. They just were. And that difference begin to make people say, okay, so tell me about Jesus. I need to know about Jesus because I'm seeing your life and your life is not like anyone else's life. And I want us to have lives that are not like anyone else's life because it's founded on the ultimate thing that Jesus has accomplished. He's met the ultimate need. So everything else doesn't have to be fearful. The last thing is this, that purpose is discovered. That what we see is that joy gets recalibrated, thanksgiving replaces fear, and purpose is discovered. And this is a really small thing, but as we begin to read our text and we begin to see resurrection and purpose combined, that Jesus is always talking about the the thing that he is doing in terms of the resurrection and the purpose we get because of it, what does he say? Really simple. Go. I think oftentimes we think, oh, if there's something that happens with Jesus, I should just stay with, with Jesus. But what does Jesus say? Go. The simplicity of this idea that Jesus knows that when someone has had their fundamental everything about them story changed, they're going to tell somebody. They're going to be one of these people that begins to say, you'll never believe what happened today. And that's kind of the rest of their life. The whole calibration of their life is, I was a leper. I was on death row. And this guy named Jesus pardoned me. But the bigger story is that through this resurrection, it didn't just change, it didn't just extend my vapor of a life a little bit longer, it changed my eternity. So he says, go. And that simple phrase that Jesus uses, go, 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 helps us to understand in light of the fact that Jesus has accomplished the, your, uh, your ultimate need, has, has met your ultimate need, he's also given you a purpose to go and to be a part of mission in that. So how does this work? Let me give you just a really quick way to understand this. This whole text plays out with a request, a response, and a realization of the resurrection. The request comes like this, Jesus, have mercy on us. The response is Jesus saying, you're healed. He's the great healer. And then the next part of this is that they realize the resurrection. They realize that this is a bigger story, right? And if we can just begin to think about these three simple R's, that these requests are met with the response, and ultimately that points us to realize the resurrection, then it helps us to be able to know how Christianity doesn't just stay a product, but becomes a person in our everyday lives. And so we think about it like this. We begin to ask 
a question, a request of Jesus. Let's, let's just, let's start with the bottom shelf. Hey, Jesus, help me get a f- girlfriend. I-, I need a girlfriend. And Jesus says, I'm the great healer. And the resurrection reality is that girlfriends are great, but they're not the ultimate. They are, they're great. But if they become ultimate, it really messes up your life. It really messes up your life. Just to clarify that statement, <laughs> really messes up your life. Girlfriends are great, but it's not ultimate. If you begin to say, you know, I'll be happy when, not when I recognize that Jesus has met my ultimate need, I'll be happy when I get a girlfriend. I'll be happy when he asks me out. I'll be happy when he notices me. That's the standard, that's the calibration of my joy. That if this is what happens, then I'll be happy. Right? This is how it's gonna work. And that is gonna set you up for a miserable life. Boyfriends are great. They're not ultimate. When you make something other than Jesus ultimate, you always get let down. Let's talk about another thing. We have a request. Jesus, help me get a career. Help me to figure out my career. Help me to help me to figure this out. And Jesus says, I'm the great healer. And the resurrection reality is this, that careers are great, but they're not ultimate. That you not, you're not who you are based upon what you do. You are who you are. Your identity is founded in the ultimate reality of you are valued by Jesus. Valued enough for him to die for you. Jesus, I'm lonely. The request. And Jesus responds, I'm the great healer. The resurrection reality is this, that your deepest relational needs are already met in a way that proves the foundation of your joy. Jesus, take away my insecurity. Jesus says, I'm the great healer. The resurrection reality is this, that he has provided you the greatest act of security in your life. And every day you can start with that truth and allow your future to know that he's ultimately done the work already. I could go through a lot of these. Here's what I want to land on. I want you to understand, I mean, even if it's Jesus, heal my body, heal my, heal my family, heal my friend, that Jesus says, I'm the great healer. And what you need to understand is I've already accomplished your ultimate need. So whether I heal your body in this life or I extend your life a little bit farther, but there's inevitability towards there's an expiration date. And what happens on the other side is a bigger question. Or maybe I make your life easier to live in this world. These are valid requests. Jesus says, I want the request, but I want you to get the context of being able to say, hey, you've already met my most significant need. I'm asking for my urgent need. And when you begin to have a posture like that, it's a posture of peace. It's a posture of wholeness. It's a posture of ultimately being able to understand that first is Jesus and then everything else is a part of grace that we get here on earth. But our biggest thing has already been met. The thing is, we oftentimes miss it. Nine of these guys missed it. One got it. And could it be that God is orchestrating minor miracles in your life, little things in your life that point you to him, that you begin to see some of this and you begin to experience this and you begins to elicit thanks in your heart and you begin to see the bigger picture that God is doing all of these things to help show you who he is and help show you this is what it looks like. And, and I want you to get that this ultimately puts you in a place of gratitude, of thankfulness, of recalibration of your joy and ultimately the purpose in your life. And could it be that Jesus is pointing to his greatest miracle and that is the miracle of his resurrection and that maybe some of you here are less than impressed. Your worship is f- flat, your prayers aren't filled with gratitude and your posture isn't face down and you're missing the bigger point. You're consumed with, God, I need you to do my thing when God's already told you that he's done the most significant thing. And so do you see it? Is this something you're gonna get? Because this idea has transformed societies, has transformed people, and has made them into completely different people just by beginning to understand the difference between what is ultimate and what is urgent.
And my prayer is that you become those kind of people and we begin to see on these towns and these campuses what it looks like to be people who have a centeredness in Christ in the resurrection that is very uncommon for the world around us and very uncommon. So where does this ultimate reality of the gospel need to speak to an urgent reality in your life? Where's that place where you would say, hey, if I'm really honest today, Keith, I've allowed urgency in this matter to invade and take my emotion, to derail my thought, to bring doubts into my life. And this is keeping me from ultimately experiencing that joy. Do you have something as I speak about this? Is there something that comes up that somehow you need to apply the reality of what God has done ultimately for you into what God is, or what is happening urgently in your life? And so where are we today? Are you acting like the nine or are you acting like the one? Maybe this is the day where you begin to say, uh, just like this Samaritan, I need to put my faith in Christ. Maybe for the first time, I, I understand what Jesus has done and I need to figure out what is ultimate in my life and that Jesus has already accomplished that. Or maybe right now you need to figure out how to be reminded of what has been ultimate and so that the urgent doesn't create tyranny in your soul. Either way, I'm praying that you would be the one.